welcome back uh, we would like to review what we did last time uh, last time we talked about electrochemical half cells and we also discussed about how to maintain continuity of the reduction oxidation process uh, if you remember there was a lump of zinc which we put in a copper sulfate solution and immediately it would be covered with uh, metal copper metal metallic copper after which uh, there won't be any reaction any further and uh, in order to maintain the continuity we basically uh, try to connect two half cells one where zinc was and zinc uh, uh, a, a salt solution of zinc and copper was independently in another salt solution of copper and then we connected uh, both the solutions externally through a salt bridge and both the electrodes with the uh, conduit and basically that kind of uh, was useful in maintaining a continuous flow of uh, uh, electrons and uh, therefore generated an EMF and a current. Uh, we also talked about electroactivity of uh, species, basically uh, the ability of uh, a particular metal, metal to displace hydrogen from water, steam or acid and uh, essentially uh, this is a very important aspect of electrochemistry because uh, we kind of know an order uh, in which what would displace what from its corresponding salt solution. Uh, we also talked about relative and abs absolute potentials and uh, we discussed the standard hydrogen electrode which is essentially a platinum electrode dipped in a 1 molar HCl solution uh, in water thus forming hydronium ions H3O plus uh, where hydrogen was bubbled through at about 1 atmosphere pressure and uh, the temperature was maintained at about 25 degrees Celsius or so. So uh, then we started uh, just about calculating. Um, cell potentials and uh, uh, there the main question uh, that needs to be addressed is how can we really um, have um, um, an idea or a relationship between the concentration of an analyte and the EMF that it would generate and so for that uh, we will be actually deriving something which uh, we have commonly known as the Nernst equation. So let me look through uh, how this derivation is done I would typically like to derive this uh, through the fundamental principles of chemistry and uh, then go ahead with utilizing this uh, Nernst equation to calculate uh, the concentrations of different analytes of interest. So uh, in order to start with we really need to find out what is the total work done by an electrochemical cell that we have discussed yesterday. So as we know uh, there is uh, a potential difference between the anode and the cathode and anode is essentially where the oxidation reaction happens, the cathode is where the reduction reaction happens and uh, due to this uh, potential difference and owing to this difference there is a flow of charge across uh, uh, the circuit from the cathode uh, from the anode to the cathode uh, there is an electron flow and correspondingly uh, there is a there is a uh, you can say that the conventional current direction is from the cathode to the anode. So uh, there is work essentially which the cell does in order to transfer. Um, some electrons from one electrode to other and the amount of electrical energy that uh, is, uh, is essentially bent during this operation of uh, an electrochemical cell is I am sorry uh, let me just go ahead and uh, give me a minute. So essentially uh, when we talk about work done from um, uh, by an electrochemical cell uh, during this operation of charge transfer the chemical energy which is stored in form of uh, the salt solution with the particular metal is transformed into electrical energy okay and uh, the, the total amount of electrical energy in this process is E dash cell into C trans where C trans is the total charge that is transferred from, from one electrode to another and uh, E dash cell is the differential cell potential between both the electrodes. So we can also express this uh, in a little different manner uh, by assuming uh, that n number of moles of electrons have really crossed from one electrode to another and uh, essentially there is this famous Faraday constant which is corresponding to uh, the charge of one mole of electron. So as we all know that the electronic charge is uh, around 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 19 coulomb and uh, if you multiply this with uh, 1 mole uh, the Avogadro number 6.0 t 3 10 to the power of 23 you get this 96,000 
485 coulomb. So essentially this value is the charge for 1 mole electrons. So if you have n mole electrons which are crossing from one electrode to another, uh, the C trans which is the total amount of charge so crossed is also known as also given as n f okay? and this is a negative charge. So you have a negative sign which comes up. So this charge is transferred uh, under a potential E dash cell and that is essentially what the maximum work done is of this system. Okay? So this uh, electrochemical cell essentially in the process of a charge transfer of n f value uh, under a cell potential E dash cell uh, makes uh, or contributes a maximum work given by minus n f E dash cell. So from the principles of thermodynamics we also know this very famous Gibbs free energy concept which is essentially the maximum energy that can be extracted from a system and uh, that can be equated to the maximum work done by the system. So really the Gibbs free energy delta G which is also given by this expression here minus R T L n K and K is the equilibrium constant which I am going to come in just about a little bit and this is essentially so this expression comes from the Van Hoff equation. Uh, we will just do this in a little bit but what I am trying to say here is that delta G uh, of uh, any free cell or uh, the free energy uh, of any free cell is also equal to the maximum work that can be done by the free cell. So delta G is minus n f e dash cell and is also can be represented as minus R T L n K. Okay. So let us look at the Van Hoff equation and how it came from thermodynamics. So the Van Hoff uh, for the first time observed that uh, there is a linear relationship between the natural log of uh, the rate of a reaction and the inverse of temperature. And the rate of a reaction again assuming this to be the reaction alpha moles of A uh, reacts with beta moles of B to, uh, to and, and with several other components here reversibly to obtain sigma moles of S, tau mole of T and several other products here. So the by the Le Chatelier's principle uh, you can really find out the rate constant of any such reaction. Okay? And what this principle says is that the rate constant of any forward reaction is proportional to the product of the activity of the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. The stoichiometric coefficients here being alpha as you see here in this uh, beta. Uh, so how many moles are participating and uh, sigma and tau. Okay? So this is what the stoichiometric coefficients of this uh, different uh, reactions are. And so therefore Le Chatelier's principle says that the rate constant uh, of any forward reaction uh, is proportional to the product of the activity um, of the uh, you know of, of, of the products raised to uh, the, the stoichiometric coefficient. So here I am just uh, about to explain a little, bit, a little bit what activity really means. At this time let us just consider it to be equal to the concentration. Okay? So activity essentially is a term. Uh, which is a factor of the concentration of a particular analyte and I will be explaining this in a great details later because for designing electrodes which would be able to do electrochemical sensing in biomems devices we need to find out sometimes the activity of an ion of interest rather than the concentration of the ion of interest. So, so essentially uh, by the Le Chatelier's principle, Le Chatelier's principle uh, the, the rate constant of any forward reaction is proportional to the product of the activity of the products that means S and T here are the products of the reaction right and it is a multiplication of the product of the activity of S and T that means the products of the reaction raised to power their stoichiometric coefficient sigma and tau and the others and divided by uh, the, the activity of the reactants uh, of uh, this particular reaction raised to power their stoichiometric coefficients which is alpha and beta. Okay. So for any general chemical reaction this is how the equilibrium constant of the rate constant of uh, uh, a particular reaction can be found out. And so this is what is, is a critical parameter to study any uh, redox reaction, reduction oxidation reaction. And essentially the change in one like let us say the change in uh, the, the, the reactant side would essentially lead to a shift in the equilibrium and there would be an increase in the forward rate 
and so what would happen is that more of A would be uh, converted into S or T and therefore uh, the equilibrium will shift back to its, its normal. Uh, so any disturbance on any side in terms of concentrations of the reactants of the products would lead to a shift of the equilibrium position and this equilibrium would try to get back to normalcy. That is how these, these redox couples really work. Okay. So, in the solutions of high ionic strength, uh, the activity coefficient is by and large constant and the activity of the product changes to the concentration. So, uh, we really bother about um, those uh, situations where um, uh, the, the ionic strength may not be uh, very huge and that is really the case uh, in some of the, uh, the samples of interest or the analytes of interest that we try to measure using bio MEMS architecture. Okay, because this ionic strength is sometimes not under control and therefore uh, how do we really measure uh, very accurately the, you know the, the EMF and, and correlate that to the concentration of an analyte which has a low ionic strength is the challenge. And for that there are certain rules and protocols uh, which are followed so that in an in vitro sense we can make a repeatable measurement and correlate the EFF, EMF uh, of such a product or, or uh, of, of such a reaction to the concentration of one of the analytes of interest. So, what uh, essentially Van Toff did is he plotted experimentally um, you know the, the rate constants, the natural log of the rate constant L n k okay, of some of these uh, reactions in the gas phase typically with uh, an inverse of temperature. Okay. And uh, what he found out that there is really a linear fit between the inverse of temperature and the, uh, the natural log of the rate constant k as has been indicated by uh, or as has been calculated from the Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. So, as there is a linear fit you could express uh, uh, you know the two parameters here in question the x and y in the form y equal to m x plus c. The uh, question is what m and c would look like. So, uh, from several experimental results uh, what he obtained is that if we consider x to be 1 by t and uh, y to be the natural log of the rate constant k, then the slope m of such uh, in such a situation was also the minus change in or it was it was the negative of the change in en enthalpy per unit the Rydberg's constant r. And uh, the intercept c in such a case in most of the cases was also the change in entropy of uh, this particular reaction per unit the Rydberg's constant r. And so, these are actually experimental results and in most of these cases in all these different equilibrium uh, situations of different uh, reactants and products he obtained an uniquely similar kind of behavior where he could find out or he could generalize that for this situation uh, the slope and the intercept are minus h by r. Rydberg's constant and minus or, or and, and delta s the change in entropy of the reaction per unit the Rydberg's constant. Okay. So, also from thermodynamics if we consider the Gibbs free energy it is given by a relationship between the enthalpy and the total entropy of the system as delta h minus t delta s. So, if we substitute for h in this particular reaction let us say we want to substitute for delta H from 1. So, delta H would be also represented as R T L n k minus T delta S and so delta H theta can be represented as T delta S theta minus R T L n k. Okay. So, let us say this equation is another representation of 1 and it can be represented as 3. So, if we put this 3 uh, to find out what really the delta G value would be from equation 2, then delta G 
theta can be represented as T delta S theta minus R T ln k minus T delta S theta Oops, sorry. <coughs> and essentially therefore, the delta j theta can be represented as minus R T ln k. Okay. So, if we consider this to be equation number 4 and uh, try to find out if there is a relationship between the, the N f e cell and this R T ln k from the Van Hoff's equation, uh, we get a very simple relationship uh, which is the foundation for Nernst equation. Okay. So, essentially we can say from we can write the equation 4 again here in more simpler terms. So, the free energy delta G which was also earlier defined as minus N f E cell where N is the number of moles of electrons flown between both electrodes and f is the Faraday constant ninety six thousand five hundred coulomb per mole charge of one mole electron and E cell equals the potential difference between both uh, both the electrodes. So, essentially delta G also can be expressed as minus R T L n k from the Van Hoff equation remember equation number 4. Okay. So, therefore, delta G which is equal to minus R T L n k can be represented as minus N f E cell. So, here is a little problem because what will happen if the equilibrium constant k equals unity or 1 right. So, essentially uh, ln of 1 as we know is 0 and therefore, uh, there would not be any free energy uh, of the system which is available. And this is, uh, this is a major problem which one faces and so therefore, we have to develop a strategy uh, where we can take care of this equation. Uh, so, that uh, in, in the equation itself. So, basically um, uh, just uh, this equation has to have uh, you know a scheme to accommodate this problem that what happens when uh, the k value is unity and so basically uh, what this equation can be modified as is that let us assume that there is a there is a certain g value uh, known as delta g 0 where uh, in, in situations when uh, the k value becomes unity right. And then we assume that this corresponds to a, a value of E cell uh, E 0 cell charge right. So, essentially uh, then this, this delta G equation gets modified to delta G 0 minus R T ln k. In this case even if k is unity uh, the delta G value uh, is equated to delta G 0 and uh, this delta G 0 can be converted or is can be thought of 
as uh, the movement of nf charges across both the electrodes at a potential difference e0 cell and therefore um, this is essentially uh, the final form of what we call or what we know as the nernst equation so delta g is again n minus nf e cell from uh, the earlier derivation and it is uh, equated to minus nf e naught cell uh, that means the corresponding potential when uh, the reactants are all one molar in concentration k mind you comes equal to 1 and one of the cases is that when all these different activities that we have been considering of a b s and t come out to be equal to all unity okay so essentially you know uh, the, the nf e cell minus nf e cell can be equated to minus nf e naught cell minus rt ln k and this is what the final form of nernst equation will look like so we can calculate the e cell value uh, by just looking at e naught cell and uh, this term here rt by nf ln of k uh, e naught cell again is uh, the cell potential when all the concentrations of so called reactants and products are unity concentration of reactants and products are unity when e cell becomes e naught cell okay so that is essentially what the nernst equation is all about so now uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing that comes up that you can really equate the emf the potential of such a system to the concentration of the reactants and the products and that is again what our goal is in all sensing that if uh, analytes of interest and the concentrations of analytes of interest can be detected by looking at their emf values of the particular cell okay so let us do a little bit of uh, post calculation onto uh, this equation uh, you know there are two aspects which I would like to mention here one is that let us think that in a reaction a certain reactant R is getting converted or oxidized into a species OX and giving an electron right. So in such a such a reaction the, the, the rate of reaction can be written as the activity of OX to the power it is stoichiometric coefficient which is 1 in this case divided by activity of are uh, uh, the material that is getting oxidized uh, to the power of its own stoichiometric coefficient which is 1 in this case and so therefore k can be written down as uh, the activity ox by activity r in case of uh, the emfs if you look at the emf e cell and nernst equation uh, it comes out to be e0 cell by this equation plus rt by nf natural log of k and k is activity of ox by activity of r okay and essentially when you are considering uh, a case where there is a metal electrode and its corresponding salt solution uh, we can safely assume uh, the the activity of uh, the metal as unity okay so because it it doesn't have its own ionic state in the solution in any case uh, it is uh, it is fixed and it, it gives ions though and uh, those ions have a certain activity a o x okay so in that case the nernst equation would change to e cell equal to e0 cell plus r t by nf ln a o x okay because the ar is unity in this case let us also look at if we can do something about this rt by nf if uh, we assume that the whole reaction takes place at room temperature and uh, standard conditions which is 25 degrees celsius uh, and uh, if we take the value of r to be 8.314 joule per kelvin mole the value of f faraday constant to be 
96480 coulomb per mole uh, T at 25 degrees Celsius means 298 Kelvin. Therefore, we can calculate the RT by NF as 0 0.06 by N. Okay? And so, therefore, in the Nernst slope, uh, the Nernst slope uh, of the E cell really comes out to be 0 0.06 by N. So, if you plot the E cell with the logarithm of the oxidant, the concentration of the ion, which is also proportional to the concentration of the analyte of interest in some cases, where the analyte is getting oxidized, uh, then the E cell and the concentration are really in terms of a linear equation. Okay? And uh, uh, that is the beauty that uh, um, uh, the, the, the slope of that equation is also inversely proportional to the number of moles of charge transfer that is taking place and the intercept of that equation is essentially this E 0 cell factor. Okay. So, let us now look at some practical electrode design problems and uh, uh, from this uh, uh, essentially we will move on to the corresponding MEMS modules of electrodes which would essentially use the same principles of uh, electrochemistry, but then uh, they will have to be considered on uh, because of because of their miniaturized size they have to be there have to be other aspects like you know uh, ionic strength or uh, the concentration of the ion of interest or whether there are any competing ions uh, in that such a solution which uh, uh, which which formulates uh, you know a major uh, uh, a major paradigm for designing such electrodes so let us look at this uh, this half cell combined uh, to a reference electrode and if you look at let us let us just look at the drawing here first to begin with. So, you have uh, you know uh, some some kind of a uh, reference electrode with respect to which you would like to measure the interaction between uh, the metal getting into the solution as uh, uh, the oxidized metal M n plus. Okay. The reference electrode here is essentially nothing but a a glass capillary which is covered by uh, this liquid junction uh, and this develops a potential let us assume E L j with respect to the solution and uh, inside this glass capillary we have this electrolyte uh, which is uh, very standardized and it has a standard concentration and it has a sensing a reference electrode here which goes into the electrolyte. So, any charge transfer that is taking place is through this liquid junction and through the electrolyte which is inside the capillary and then goes on to this conduit this wire here as you can see and uh, this is essentially formulates an EMF here because of this configuration and can be the reference electrode with respect to which you measure the, uh, the, the activity of a metal and a solution like this. Okay. So, if we look at uh, if we really connect these two you know externally uh, let us say we are trying to measure by connecting these two externally uh, using a voltmeter uh, give me one minute. Okay. So, let us say uh, we are just trying to connect these two electrodes externally using a voltage measuring device. So, in that case the E cell in this uh, particular configuration can be written down as the E dash metal to metallic ion conversion M to M n plus conversion. So, the, the potential of this interaction between metal and the metal solution or the salt solution of the metal minus uh, the E reference potential which is at this point. E R E F minus again the liquid junction potential which is again contributing to the ion exchange process between the external solution and the internal solution. Okay. And so, from the Nernst equation as you know already if we consider the activity of the metal here to be equal to unity E dash uh, cell in that case or E dash uh, of this oxidation or the EMF produced by this oxidation reaction can be written down as the E 0 dash 
this oxidation reaction corresponding to uh, the case when the reaction rate is unity or the, or the rate constant k is unity plus uh, the Nancyian slope s 0 0.06 by n log of m n plus the concentration of the oxidant okay and essentially uh, if the so the E cell can be represented as uh, this this particular value here which is E dash 0 plus S log of m n plus oxidant minus E reference minus E L j. So, we can actually pull this together and make uh, this under the same bracket as E dash 0 minus E reference minus E i j and plus S times of log concentration of m n plus and uh, this is essentially a straight line. Okay. So, if you plot the E cell value here, uh, give me one minute, let me. Uh, okay. So, if you plot the E cell value, uh, let us say we plot it somewhere here with respect to the concentration of the oxidant M n plus right. You get a straight line uh, from this particular equation y which is E cell equal to M x M being the slope s plus c which is E dash 0 minus E reference minus i j. We assume this to be k let us suppose and this to be slope M. So, this here is really what the slope k is or this intercept k is and uh, the slope of the straight line is s. So, therefore, again uh, this, this EMFN concentration shows a strange linearity all right. So, uh, the next point uh, which I would like to emphasize is uh, that uh, really uh, if you look at the solution on a very uh, close basis there is a lot of other activity uh, which is going on inside the solution okay and uh, the uh, the the concentration of uh, an ion is really very very diffused because there are so many other ion to ion attractions or interactions which are happening uh, that really can we say that the ion of interest that we are looking at has exactly uh, the same effect in the charge transfer process as its concentration. Okay. So, therefore, it is uh, pertinent to describe uh, a term uh, which can give an idea of what happens when this small ion is uh, interacting with several other competing ions. Uh, there are forces of attraction repulsion, there is you know uh, a change in its overall state. There are so many counter ions which are there in the solution. Uh, let us say we are detecting a calcium plus 2 or positive calcium ion. So, there are a lot of let us say chlorine ions uh, around it. So, there are these are counter ions. So, there are ion clouds and uh, there are this uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, central ion of interest. So, the, so the activity of an ion uh, is uh, the corresponding uh, uh, you know uh, the corresponding factor the corresponding term. Uh, which uh, which can give an idea uh, of of uh, the interactions between ions both electrostatic and and covalent okay so the ionic activity uh, can be defined as of an of an ion can be defined as the 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 result of the interactions between uh, ions both electrostatic and covalent and uh, the activity of an ion is influenced by its surroundings and uh, the, so, so if uh, suppose uh, the ion uh, is in a cage of water molecules uh, it may have a different activity factor than when it is in the middle of the counter ion cloud. Okay. And uh, in most electrochemistry the activity of the surrounding non interfering ions is kept very high so that the target ions are able to get detected in trace concentrations and also do not easily get affected by their own interactions. So, uh, this is something very uh, very critical to be observed that in situations where uh, you have several competing ions the best way 
to, uh, to reduce the interaction between these con competing ions is to create a high ionic background okay. And essentially you create something some ions or something which is which is having an ionic state, but it is non interfering with the ions of interest. So, if such a kind of situation happens then you can by and large create a huge background. So, that these interactions between the competing ions become very very small or insignificant. In that case the ionic activity which is the more appropriate term giving an idea of the electronic interactions uh, can be described as the activity coefficient and this is a constant terms the concentration of the particular ion of interest. Now, this activity coefficient can be uh, you know in depending on different situations it can have different values where sometimes the ionic activity can be too high sometimes it can be too low. And uh, if the idea is that if you have a surrounding non interfering heavy ion cloud around the target ion uh, it kind of uh, gets equal to the concentration of the ion and uh, you can easily get to detect the exact uh, quantity of the target ion of interest ok. And uh, so therefore, uh, sp especially in MEMS kind of protocols uh, where we are talking about selecting uh, over a very small uh, you know over a very small volume of liquid there is always uh, almost always a tendency of uh, the activity uh, to be very much different than the concentration. And uh, so, uh, so uh, we are next going to find out uh, how it is possible by designing an electrode to pick up a certain ion uh, over let us say several competing ions and that is how we get into the field of ion selective electrode ok. So, basically uh, let us do a little bit uh, a small problem on uh, finding out the the EMF before going into the ion selective electrodes. So, in this example uh, there is a galvanic cell which consists of a standard hydrogen electrode and a rod of zinc dipping into a solution of zinc ions at 298 Kelvin. And if it gives a measured EMF of minus uh, 0 0.789 volts find out the activity of the zinc ions. So, we apply the Nernst equation here and uh, essentially uh, the E cell in this case can be represented as the E 0 cell plus the Nernstian slope 0 0.06 divided by n, n in this case because it is a zinc uh, getting oxidized into Z n plus 2 and 2 electrons the n equals actually 2 in this case ok. And, uh, into log of the activity of zinc plus 2 ions ok. So, if we so it, it is written I mean or it is given in the problem that uh, the, the EMF E of this particular cell is minus 0 0.789 volts ok. And, uh, um, uh, you know the this uh, with respect to uh, uh, it, th this is with respect to um, a, a standard hydrogen electrode. So, the E 0 uh, the standard potential with respect to that electrode uh, from the tables uh, which uh, I have described in my earlier lecture comes out to be 0 0.76 volts ok. Um, so, uh, this is essentially the half cell potential. Uh, if you remember we had discussed a table wherein all these half cell potentials were uh, found out by connecting the respective cell to a standard hydrogen electrode. So, uh, from this equation therefore, substituting the values of E and E 0 and uh, n equal to 2 we obtain the log of the activity of Z n as 2 times of minus 0 0.789 minus of minus 0 0.76 divided by 0 0.06 ok. And the activity of zinc comes out to be equal to 
0 0.1 molar. So, so uh, the activity of the zinc ions in this particular example uh, is around 0 0.1 molar. It may happen the concentration of the zinc ions is a little more, but due to the shielding effect the activity may be a little less. Okay, so now let us look at uh, what these ion selective electrodes are or what they do. Okay. So, we are very often faced with the problem of detection where there are more than one competing ions in a particular solution. Okay. And in that case uh, we want to find out a particular ion in an analyte of interest. So, uh, essentially the ion selective electrode is a transducer which converts the activity of a specific ion of interest okay, dissolved in a solution into an electric potential. So, even though there are more than one such ions in the solution uh, and the ion of interest has to be specifically uh, reported using an ion selective electrode. Okay. So, the basic setup of an ion selective electrode uh, can be uh, represented here in this particular figure. And if you look at uh, the setup, uh, you can see that there are two electrodes. One is the reference electrode, uh, which is made in a similar manner uh, with a capillary and uh, essentially a, a liquid junction, okay, like any reference electrode would uh, make. And uh, an electrode immersed inside a solution uh, of standard or known concentration uh, of ions. Okay. And uh, the, the ion selective electrode essentially is uh, a kind of copy of the same uh, with an exception that uh, instead of the liquid junction, you now have a membrane here which is selective to an ion of interest. So, therefore, um, this membrane is designed in a manner that it can take up only a few ions of interest from the solution which this membrane is designed to take up. And therefore, this whole assembly is, is immersed inside the analyte of interest and uh, the potential of is, is found out, the, diff the potential difference is found out between the reference and the ion selective electrode. Okay. And uh, so, therefore, uh, we can say that uh, it can specifically, the job of it is to specifically select one particular ion over a range of different ions. Uh, suitable examples are pH electrodes okay, and just picking up hydrogen ions. So, the pH electrode picks up only hydrogen ions and leaves the other ones behind. So, therefore, uh, that is an ion selective electrode. Okay. So, the basic uh, ISC setup includes a meter, a probe, okay, selective to each analyte and the selection is done by using this small membrane here and uh, essentially um, it also uses various consumables uh, used for pH or ionic strength adjustments. Okay. This is important because uh, you want to create a large background uh, of ions so that you can pick up an ion of interest in that background. All right. uh, so, the interaction of that particular ion of interest with the other ions surrounding it uh, are eliminated by the strong interaction forces offered by the background in general. But uh, again, as uh, the background ions are non-interfering in nature, they would really not contribute to any uh, charge transfer process. Uh, the only charge transfer would come due to the particular ion of interest. Okay. So, an ion selective electrode essentially uh, is based on the measurement of the potential generated across uh, a membrane here, a selective membrane here. Uh, the membrane is usually attached to the end of this tube um, and uh, essentially there is a solution here for internal reference of this particular electrode and uh, uh, the whole assembly is immersed into the analyte for the measurement purpose. Let us talk a little bit more about what these membranes are or what they are supposed to do. Okay. So, the basic property that is imparted onto the ion selective electrode is by virtue of the membrane. Okay. And so, the membrane should have some characteristic of some feature, uh, maybe uh, if it is a network of pores uh, which might match to a certain ion size, 
it, it might be able to pick up a certain ion over uh, the n number of other competing or interfering ions. So, there is a size based selection in that case. It could also be made up of um, some biological material uh, which can recognize only a certain ion or a certain group of ions of interest. Okay. So, uh, essentially the, uh, uh, the, the there are several different kind of ion exchange membranes uh, that are available uh, for designing ion selective electrodes. Let us look at um, these one by one. So, there are these glassy membranes uh, which are made from um, you know an ion exchange type of glass. Okay and uh, they are uh, typically uh, the silicates of chalcogenide metals. Chalcogenide if you if you just recall from the group 6 of uh, the periodic table are sulphur, selenium or tellurium. These are also known as the chalcogenides okay? uh, the group 6 elements of the periodic table. So, essentially uh, uh, the silicates of such metals um, form excellent ion exchange type of glassy materials. So, they are covalently bonded uh, uh, materials. Uh, so, so, you can think of the entire glass matrix uh, as an infinitely bonded molecule. Okay. So, it is one bonded molecule with uh, uh, in between uh, spurts of these sulphur, selenium, tellurium these kind of metals. So, such glasses uh, have the tendency uh, by maybe the virtue of their crystal structures to show uh, show high selectivity for single charge cations. Okay. So, uh, ions like let us say hydrogen plus, sodium, Na plus, uh, silver or some uh, at the most some double charged metal ions such as let us say lead and, and the cadmium ions. So, these glasses show a strange tendency of just uh, adhering to uh, a certain size with a single charge and a certain size with a double charge. So, that is why it is probably uh, related something to do with the crystal structure of uh, these uh, covalently bonded uh, silicates of calcogenide. Okay. The other, other type of ion exchange membranes are crystalline membranes and one example that I can quote is the lanthanum fluoride crystal for fluorine ions. Okay. So, essentially this is a size based selection again. So, uh, these contain mono or polycrystallites of single substances, only those uh, ions uh, which can introduce themselves within the crystal are selected uh, by virtue of uh, the membrane being formed by this crystalline material. So, uh, these are some of the various types of ion exchange membranes that are available. Some more could be these ion exchange resin membranes, these are very interesting in nature. So, there is a compound called valinomycin okay, which is normally available in the cell membranes of uh, streptomyces and uh, essentially uh, the, the purpose uh, of uh, such, such a compound is to give way to um, exocytotic processes of exchange of potassium and calcium ions uh, between the periplasm and the cytoplasm of uh, a certain cell. Okay. So, therefore, uh, if such kind of materials can be uh, again uh, enclosed or entrapped in inside um, a polymeric uh, material or a polymeric resin. Uh, it can form an excellent source of selection of let us say potassium or calcium just as it happens naturally um, in, in case of cell uh, by virtue of opening and closing of ion channels. Uh, inside you know the, the artificial membrane that you make using these. So, the, the, the whole idea here is that uh, valinomycin uh, which is also an organic extract uh, specially uh, it is, uh, it, it is uh, um, you know it is a natural extract you can say uh, uh, can be used for um, uh, the same application that it is used for naturally. Okay. And uh, this can be a fantastic ion selective electrode. Another type of uh, ion, ion exchange uh, membrane uh, is really enzyme electrodes. Although these um, uh, these are really more related to uh, the overall selectivity of an analyte of interest. Okay. So uh, what happens that in such an electrode there is an enzyme which would react to only a particular substrate. 
So, the, the whole purpose of sensing or a detection is to detect one particular species over the other competing species right. So, in this case the particular enzyme may just react to the species of interest say for example, in glucose as I have mentioned earlier quite a number of times this glucose oxidase enzyme uh, would oxygenate glucose and break it into gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide and therefore, this is again giving a selectivity aspect to the sensing mechanism ok. Hydrogen peroxide can be measured by a pH electrode of course, which has some other ion selective membrane which can maybe some glass of calc calcogenite which can which can easily uh, take up the hydrogen plus ions over the other competing ion ok. So, uh, that in a nutshell what uh, uh, the ion selective electrodes are how are they constructed. So, essentially the electrodes are prepared from a glass capillary tubing and uh, the resin material in most of these is uh, polyvinyl chloride PVC ok. Uh, which is dissolved in a solvent and uh, added with some plasticizers. I would just like to recall that plasticizers uh, uh, give this unique ability uh, of the polymer to flow more you know by getting into the chains of a polymer and make uh, the chains roll over more easily. So, uh, you add some plasticizers for making it more uh, fluidic in nature ok, especially when they are in the liquid form before they cure and so therefore, uh, this particular ion specific material uh, whatever uh, you you have to um, design is is added to this this particular solution and uh, the, the, the and then this uh, this this capillary is dipped into the solution and solution gets into the end and forms a small plug ok and plug is provided uh, a, a certain ion uh, you know certain strength uh, ionic strength of a particular solution uh, is, is put into uh, the glass capillary and uh, therefore, you have this this uh, this capillary uh, the solution inside it a conduit which is coming out and then the end which is a plug uh, uh, with with uh, maybe polyvinyl chloride uh, polymeric resin with the ion exchange uh, uh, material trapped inside it. So, uh, this this can give uh, uh, all properties of what an ion selective electrode would essentially need. The reference electrolyte uh, uh, which is filled inside can vary depending on what analyte of interest uh, is being measured using this particular electrode ok. So, uh, when we talk about uh, the various MEMS modules for electrodes uh, you know the, the, the basic idea in MEMS is that whatever is uh, being done by the conduit can be transferred onto a microchip level and uh, some uh, of these electrodes essentially uh, can be you know uh, screen printed onto these chips rather than uh, ju just you know hanging plain wires. Like for example, if you look at this particular chip here and uh, this is again an excerpt from you know uh, lab on chip uh, as a paper reported in lab on chip for measurement of exocytosis uh, processes you know in single cells essentially. And this is also an excerpt of um, uh, a work that had been earlier done in our group. Uh, so, if you see here these are screen printed electrodes on a silicon wafer uh, which can be easily fabricated using this uh, microfabrication strategies that we have been talking about before. And uh, there are these, uh, these small positioning channels these narrow small positioning channels between these sensing electrodes and uh, two reservoirs essentially on both sides here. And so, there is a flow of cells and positioning of cells over these individual channels uh, or electrodes and uh, the ion exchange resin here can be coated spin coated selectively using photolithography on certain specific areas where uh, these electrodes interact with the solution of interest ok. And can be rapidly recorded using a DAC system a data acquisition system. And so, all uh, the electronics can be built surrounding the particular chip here of uh, interest and uh, this can be a bio MEMS device to uh, measure electrochemistry of a single cell ok. So, how do we fabricate some of these devices to make the positioning of the cell uh, is very interesting that uh, you basically make a channel here. Uh, in this particular form in, in a silicon in a manner 
that is shown like this okay. So, this essentially is the top elevation of the device. So, you have a cell reservoir on one side uh, these are all microscopic features and you have a transportation channel which is blocked here at this particular end okay. So, this channel is blocked in one end and emanating out of the cell reservoir and uh, there are these docking stations these small 15 microns by 15 micron uh, docking stations in silicon which can dock a cell like this okay. And uh, following this there is a small channel a very small channel which is lower than the size of the cell, but can essentially flow the fluid which is carrying or transporting this cell to this docking station. So, if you look at this whole assay on the side view uh, this is essentially where the cell would go and dock right and this is the small dam which is able to connect both sides that means side 1 and side 2 on this device. So, this is the waste channel side okay. The waste channel side is similarly positioned okay. So, if you see at uh, see the waste, waste side uh, you, you find out that uh, the waste side also has a channel emanating from this waste reservoir and uh, it goes and stops or gets blocked all the way here and there are connecting channels in between uh, the main flow channel and the waste channel in this particular manner okay. So, the cell comes here docks itself and the solution which carries the cell is able to move uh, from this particular dam area into the waste area. That way the fluidics is made continuous the fluid flow is made continuous. So, the fluid comes like this goes into this area because it cannot go ahead anymore because it has a blocking here there is a certain pressure here and it comes and positions the cell and moves out into the waste reservoir something like this. Uh, but then we can actually make the docking station of the size of a single cell okay. So, therefore, if it is 15 by 15 microns and we assume the diameter of this particular mammalian cell to be about 15 microns this is what happens you have uh, these, these cells here kind of docked in these docking stations. And the electrodes the platinum working electrodes are placed just about uh, the docking position and here you can give the ion exchange resin in form of a coating. So, that whatever happens to the cell or whatever releases happen from the cell through its ion channels can be easily gauged using this platinum electrodes through this ion exchange coating which can be given on the membrane or which can be given on the top of the electrode here. Okay. So, this is a, a fantastic example of how an electrochemical device can be fabricated uh, you know from uh, from a MEMS platform to, so to, to more towards a MEMS platform. Thank you.